Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our Heritage.org website on all of these occasions, those who will be joining us on C-SPAN and other network coverage. Of course, we remind our internet and online viewers that you're welcome to send questions or comments simply emailing them to us at speaker at heritage.org. We will post the program soon afterwards for your future reference. And of course, please double check that our cell phones have been turned off as we all start the program. Hosting our discussion today is Hella Dale, Senior Fellow for Public Diplomacy in our Douglas and Sarah Allison Center for Foreign and National Security Policy. Many know her quite well from her weekly Foreign Affairs and Defense and National Security Issues column. She is also a media fellow at the Hoover Institution, serves on the Board of Visitors of the Institute on Political Journalism, and the Center for Free Inquiry at Hanover College in Indiana. Please join me in welcoming Hella Dale. Hella? Welcome to the Heritage Foundation. Uh, today's panel is convened hastily to discuss a burning foreign policy issue we're facing. The world was shocked to wake up to the news last week that Russian troops had invaded Ukraine. After three months of mass demonstrations, the Ukrainian people had succeeded in ousting the Kremlin-backed president, Viktor Yanukovych. Russia reacted to this development on February 29th, sorry, 28th, this is not a leap year, by violating Ukraine's territorial integrity, occupying important sites across the Crimean Peninsula. Under the pretext of protecting Russian people, the deployment of Russian troops into Crimea demonstrates a blatant disregard for Ukraine's national sovereignty. The international community has reacted with condemnation, but so far little serious action. We are extremely fortunate to have with us today three young professional Ukrainians who are visiting and working here in Washington at this critical time. They will share with us their personal experiences of Ukraine's national trauma and analyze for us its political and economic consequences. Our first speaker will be Nikolai Vorobiov, who is the editor of um, Euro Patrol Inve uh, an investigative website. He has reported from the barricades in Kiev and other Ukrainian cities since the uprising there began. He has also covered elections in Moscow, Georgia, and Egypt. Um, and his blog, Correspondent.net, was shut down when the web portal was purchased by a close relative of former President Yanukovych. Our next speaker will be um, Maxim Beznoshik, uh, who is an Atlas Core Fellow at NCSJ. He received uh, a Master of Law degree from the University of Edinburgh, and he holds Bachelor and Specialist degrees in International Law from Kiev National University. Uh, he has worked at the Renewable Energy Center in Kiev, uh, where he focused on the renewable energy market in Ukraine, and has also been associated with the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies and the UN Development Program in Ukraine. And finally, the Heritage Foundation's own visiting fellow, Irina Fedets. She is also an Atlas Core Fellow here at the Heritage Foundation where she serves as a senior visiting senior policy analyst for economic freedom in Europe and Central Asia. Irina previously worked as a Kiev-based uh, consult consultant for the Institute for Economic Research and Policy. She holds BA and MA degrees in sociology from the National University of Kiev. I've asked each of them to speak for roughly 10 minutes I know we have a PowerPoint presentation, and I'm hoping to get some personal insights as well as uh, some analysis from our speakers. Over to you, Nikolai. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, thanks for your presentation, uh, for your introduction, and to Heritage Foundation, of course, for uh, invitation. Uh, uh, I'm Nikolai Vorobyov, I'm Ukrainian journalist. I came to Washington DC three, three weeks ago. So I just operate with uh, f latest information, uh, what's going on inside Ukraine. 
and uh, I I stay in touch in my uh, with my colleagues in Kiev and like southern Ukraine also Crimea so just quite familiar with the situation. Uh, I've been working science uh, 2009 after receiving my master's degree in uh, Ukrainian uh, National University. Uh, well. Uh, Actually, I have a presentation, but it's like a little bit huge. So I want to focus mostly on practical things. Uh, the problem here in the United States, I think that like for journalists uh, which come to Ukraine to cover the situation is because they are um, don't, uh, mo most of them, despite their professionals, of course, nobody, uh, no doubts, but uh, they come to Ukraine just for a couple of weeks and uh, do like briefly cover coverage of the situation that's why so i the my suggestions always to the journalists here it's just to make more stories uh, than news maybe i hope so so uh, i would like to start with prehistory about the situation in ukraine and first the three myths since i'm here like three weeks i'd want to uh, uh, present you three myths uh, in uh, American society about what's going on in Ukraine and this, simultaneously I want to destroy it right here. So the first is that Ukrainian people state which are staying on Maidan still now, till now they are uh, for uh, signing, they went for, uh, uh, for signing uh, agreement of association and being a member of European Union. So now we are, uh, it's not true because people uh, now on Maidan and they started it yeah, maybe the beginning was because of this uh, association agreement and uh, because uh, the president decided to, by his own, to refuse to sign it. But the main idea why people stay there is because of their freedom, rights and liberties. It's like for Western, I can say it's like Western values because like uh, our system, our political system uh, is corrupt, our judges are also corrupt and so on and so on. So people stay there just for freedoms. Not, it's not about the membership of about some like piece of paper. Uh, yeah. Uh, the second is um, uh, the membership. We are not talking now about uh, Ukraine to participate in European Union because I mean, because for now, f uh, it's, it's uh, impossible. The, th the second myth, there are uh, a lot of pro-Russian support, uh, no, no, the second myth is uh, there is a, uh, it now uh, East, Eastern Ukrainian, they confront Western Ukrainian. It's also, it's not true, because maybe part of this we had during the Orange Revolution, we had a lot of supporters of ruling party, uh, party of regions, which the, the, uh, our ex-president uh, was the leader, uh, but now it's not confront between East and West, it confront between like uh, people and criminals. That's why. So uh, in our previous government, they were, uh, as I, I mentioned, uh, it was like completely corrupted and completely criminal people from East, Eastern Ukraine. But it's not about the confrontation between between two parts of Ukraine. The Ukraine is united is united for now and for sure, and South Ukraine as well. And the third myth. Uh, there are a lot of pro-Russian supporters in Crimea and in the East. It's also not true, because uh, the problem is the lack of information. Uh, 70, up to 70% of Ukrainians, they have never been abroad. Uh, on the other hand, we have like uh, maybe 25 to 30% of pensioners, people who are, which, uh, who are o over 60. So they, are simp they could be simply manipulated uh, um, First of all, by Russian media, by Russian media channel. That's why, that's because of lack of information. But I talked to my friends in Crimea, in Eastern Ukraine, and they, they, they don't want to, part, to join Russia or have like Russian troops in uh, their own uh, city or country, of course. And uh, uh, talking about Crimea, people are interested to get profits during the res, uh, season, uh, summer season. Yeah. Uh, tourist season, yeah, they, they want to, to get profits and when like uh, potential tourists see what happens in Crimea, there are like some banderas or like ra Russian uh, troops, nobody will go there. That's why people worry about their profits because 70% uh, of uh, local population in Crimea, in this peninsula, uh, they uh, uh, live because um, they live because of uh, these profits from uh, tur tourism. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I have also short presentation. I mean, I will be shortly. And some statistic. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, 
yeah, it's some statistic just to understand the situation, and it's not very good. So according to this, we we just 30% of Ukrainians they live below uh, uh, the poverty line. That's why the population is really poor. Uh, the average pension is like up to three hundred dollars <laughs> per month. Uh, uh, then, like uh, we have like a lot, of, a lot of young people, like uh, maybe like uh, like. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a lot of immigrants. Yeah, a lot of immigrants. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, the second is yeah. There's some position in uh, yeah. Probably there is also Transparency International. And we, the position as uh, are not also good because we held like the sa we share uh, the same position in transparency list uh, with uh, uh, some African countries and Iran, and uh, yeah, and the freedom of speech during the uh, ruling uh, the, during the last uh, our ex president Yanukovych the. Um, uh, indicators. Yeah, yeah, indicators. It's uh, decreased dramatically, you know, because we now we, we we've uh, heard about this. We saw this pressure on journalists and this like uh, brutality uh, to uh, toward journalists from police, and that's the problem. And yes, uh, this is freedom of free. You, you can see. So uh, during the Orange time, Orange Revolution is 2008. Uh, we had like. Eight, we hold like 87 position, and during the President Yanukovych get power, it's like 2010. Uh, a lot of journalists during the rallies, and maybe we will discuss it later, uh, during the rallies, a lot of uh, journalists were injured. I will explain you how what happened. Uh, when uh, a lot of foreigner, foreign media, they came to Ukraine, and they were, well, they are also experienced, they say we've been in Iraq, we've been in uh, Afghanistan, we've covered the situation, so we are okay, we are experienced enough and you shouldn't just to uh, or rather to recommend us how to behave but then they, they turn out that it's not a good for journalists especially during the clashes on Khrushchevskov street which not far from Maidan it was not good idea to wear the jackets before because when police they started to use traumatic uh, guns the these guys in jackets they were shot first that's why. So I don't know the next survey of freedom of press. And maybe, yeah, it's also from the presentation. Maybe this is a famous. Actually, they, all of them are wanted. So maybe if you saw them, <laughs> please let us know. <laughs> and of course, our president. So, yeah, so uh, this is the people who are, uh, to, to our, we are concerned that there are people that are responsible of massacre, massacres in, on Maidan Square. There is our former prime, prime minister, Mr. Azarov and former uh, Minister of Interior Affairs, uh, Mr. Zakharchenko, then the next Kluyev, the head of administration, President's administration, and the second is, uh, the first force is Akhmetov. He is a billionaire and he, he was uh, the main oligarch which supported like ruling party of regions. That's why. So we are concerned that the people are guilty and they should be punished because like of massacres. And like maybe then, uh, Just another minute or two, if you want. Okay. Uh, uh, well, so, uh, sorry, so so much information. Uh, uh, well, uh, there is also, uh, we have, in, um, uh, I, I also hear this question here in the United States, uh, why Maidan still, like, for example, Orange Revolution, the camps on Maidan, it was like for two weeks. The, the, it lasts for lasted for two weeks, and Maidan lasted. It's still lasting. So, like, uh, we determined like uh, several uh, several tipping uh, tipping points of Maidan. You can find it here. So maybe for example, November 22 is the first protest. I want to s emphasize that the first people who went to Maidan because the president he resigned to uh, uh, sign this association, uh, he refused to re uh, sign this uh, agreement of association. The first people it was not. Uh, it were not more than 300 protesters. Then November 30, when uh, mm -hmm. police brutally beat these people, and most of them there were students. They left in the camp, which they uh, established. Uh, they stand. They established on Maidan. So then on the next day, we had up to uh, half a million people on Maidan Square, and nobody left. Uh, I, uh, nobody left after this. Yeah, some pictures. Yeah. Then December uh, 11. 
uh, it it was the second uh, uh, try of Polish to to put out protesters from Maidan. And uh, another tipping point is the, uh, December 24, when our famous journalist, she was uh, she she is Tatiana Chernovil, she was kidnapped and brutally beaten by some like gangs. Nobody knows their name, but she's famous in she was she is famous in Ukraine because uh, of her investigation on the luxury house of our uh, former president Yanukovych in Mezhigiri. Probably you've heard about this place. And yes, some pictures and the protest around Ukraine. Yeah, so here you can see fir uh, first uh, four uh, victim, uh, victims on Maidan. So they were killed on Hrushevskova street uh, in, uh, in January 22. And yeah, it's really significant that one of them is Mikh Mikhail Zhiznevsky. He is natively, he is Belarusian. Another is uh, Sergei Niganyan, he is Armenian. So this guy, Yuri uh, Verbitsky and uh, Roman uh, Senek, mm, they're from Western Ukraine, from Lviv. For example, Yuri Verbitsky, he was not killed on, uh, directly on Khrushchevskova street, on Maidan. He was kidnapped and brutally beaten. But according to the uh, official statements of uh, our, uh, our interior ministry on that period, they say that he, was, he, he died not because of brutally beaten, but because he was frozen. It was very cold outside, that's why. Uh, he was kidnapped with one of my friends. He is Igor Lutsenko. You can see him on the meet. Uh, and uh, Igor Lutsenko, he is a very popular uh, ac activist in Ukraine. And uh, uh, when he disappeared, uh, a lot of like a lot of media, they started to, to look in for him. That's why he probably, because it's one of the reasons, despite he was beaten, he was released. As he could survive, but unfortunately, Mr. Verbisky, he was dead. And Dmitry Bulatov, now he is a uh, minister of uh, sports and culture. Of, of, yeah, uh, yeah. Culture, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, very open minded, very young man. He is a brave man. Uh, he was also kidnapped and tortured. And he is, uh, during the uh, Yevra Maidan, like, uh, he was a head uh, of uh, movement called After Maidan which so-called like cavalry of Maidan. So people take their cars and make some like uh, uh, protests near the houses of our like uh, officials, top officials. And international reaction. And yes, yeah, some units of Maidan, it could be also very interesting for you because we had this after Maidan, which I mentioned. Uh, then the unit special veterans of Afghanistan, like I mean, it calls so-called self-defense of Maidan so should like a lot of people who were killed late in February 20, they were from self-defense. So people with just uh, shitty, shitty uh, sh sh shields, yeah. yeah. So yeah, and one of them that's veteran of Gav Afghanistan. As far as you know, uh, we had Ukrainian troops in Af Afghanistan during the uh, Soviet invasion there in 1979, uh, 1989. So yeah, it's like people who are uh, uh, like soldiers who are experienced like from um, battlefields. Yeah, so just shortly. And two more, like, uh, yes, yeah, so like Spilna TV, this uh, is uh, it's very popular now in Ukraine. It's a new stream directly from what, what happened in Maidan right now. So you can just Google and find this. And what was that called again? It calls Spilna TV. Okay. Spilna TV, you can find it. Uh, unfortunately, these tents, it's there actually, it's their tents, but it was burned. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I think people might <clears throat> like to be able to do that. I, I hate to interrupt you, but we need to make sure that your colleagues... Um, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, or, or I can finish, we can... Ju oh, just a few sentences about this. Oh, absolutely. The current situation. Well, let, let's focus... Yeah, and this National Guard, Guard and this the medical volunteer, that really brave uh, young um, uh, men and women, and they just help people, injured people, and because it was dangerous for uh, for injured to uh, for injured to get them to hospitals, you know, because the same time police will come and they could take it in the, in jail right from this from the hospital, despite they're injured. So uh, a few hospitals were cre established, created uh, on Maidan, particular on, and these volunteers they contribute a lot to. To, to make it possible. Uh, well, and just um, 
coming back to uh, the uh, the current situation. So, uh, so uh, as far as it's, it's changing uh, all the time, so uh, our uh, mm, conclusion are the following. Uh, despite Putin has withdrawn his uh, military from eastern Ukrainian border, uh, they uh, increased the number of troops in Crimea, and according to the last statistic, it's like up to 30,000 uh, uh, of soldiers. And now, uh, the, the another tipping point for us could be the next referendum. I think that my colleague, uh, Maxim, he will tell more about the referendum, yeah, which is scheduled on... Uh, se yeah, he, he, will, uh, he will give his... Uh, yeah. And yeah, so uh, the, the referendum in Crimea in uh, March 16, and the second, the second key, uh, people continue to protest on Maidan right now, uh, and just demanding to not only to change the faces, but to reset all the system. Uh, uh, some statistic, it also could be interesting for you, that when Maidan has started, was like we have two, two oppositional leaders as far as you know. Before Miss Timoshenko she was released, we had Miss Yatsenyuk, leader of Batkivshina, uh, uh, Mr. Tjahnibok, and a uh, former uh, heavyweight boxer Klitschko. And the, the, just, the support, uh, the, uh, like the explanation why people went to Maidan, that's what the following, that like only 5% on Maidan were there because of politicians. It's clear, yeah? I mean, so people stand there because of their rights, because of Ukrainian prospects in the European Union, but not because of politicians, so only 5%. And maybe like some, I, maybe some just, last but not the least, but some weakness point of, uh, for now, like maybe some, weaknesses. Weak, weak sides. Weak sides of revolution or something, so. Uh, uh, despite that uh, our former president, he resigned and he left the country, the system remained the same. So now we have only changes of faces. And I mean, uh, if uh, Ms. Mr. Yanukovych, he was a godfather of some oligarchs, now Timoshenko, probably she's a godmother of some oligarchs, because they made this the same business during the 19th. Uh, that's, uh, that's why people demand new leaders, new activists, and new politicians who never been in the parliament, at least. Uh, the second is uh, uh, that uh, mm, nobody, uh, despite these massacres on Maidan, nobody still were punished. I mean, among people, uh, I mean, who shot the people. So these people are are, are not in jail. I think they need. Uh, I, I, I hesitate. Hate to do this, but we. We must make sure everybody uh, hear from yeah. everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah, sorry. And we, we can leave for discussion. Yeah. I know, it's yes. Well, thanks. Uh, please, uh, thanks. Uh, over to you. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks to the Heritage Foundation for giving me this opportunity to share some of my opinions on the current situation in Ukraine. And uh, um, I will, I will uh, try to be brief uh, as possible so that you could ask us some questions. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, uh, this uh, this current situation is the outcome of uh, 20 years of continuous corruption and continuous abuse of power in Ukraine, and uh, well, that was aimed at uh, Ukrainian people directly, and which led to the to the current situation that we had, and which is uh, which led to this uh, Maidan phenomenon that uh, took place in the end of November. So uh, it happened. Uh, well, I would like to say that. Uh, uh, this is due to the fact that U Ukraine has uh, uh, has to make its civilizational choice because we are located in a very fragile area between uh, between Europe and between Russia. So we have to make a choice. We cannot uh, be neutral, and uh, we have uh, to decide for ourselves uh, uh, which way should we go. And it's uh, and it's critically important to do it as uh, soon as possible uh, and to take all the possible steps to, to do that because uh, last events of the last three year, uh, three months, uh, they uh, have proven that uh, our na uh, national security and our defense cannot really uh, be based on this neutrality status and we have really uh, to take all the necessary steps to, uh, uh, to do something about it and uh, I will talk about it in my... Uh, in my discussion about the situation, so uh, so I think that uh, my my done happened because of uh, not only because of uh, 
of uh, this civilization and choice of most of Ukrainian people, their desire to pursue uh, uh, EU integration and live in a better country, more democratic, but also because uh, it's a it has become a revolution of dignity and of, because uh, after people were beaten in the end of November and after all, all other uh, sets of uh, set of events, uh, uh, people just started to fight for themselves and against the, the government that uh, occupied uh, the country and uh, uh, just used people and uh, as, uh, as, as means to, to benefit from them and to transfer money abroad and to uh, leave Ukrainian people poor and uh, without any means of living. So uh, in this current uh, set of circumstances, I think that, uh, uh, and because of the situation with the Crimea, I think that we should uh, uh, take, uh, take the following steps. First of all, we, as uh, what have been discussed uh, by the previous speaker, we have to take steps uh, with regard to ensure our information security because uh, the inflow and information that comes from Russian Federation distorts all the facts and all uh, everything what is happening in Ukraine. That is why uh, we need to, uh, to do something about it and to, um, maybe to uh, to create some some uh, some institutional body that will help that will be contain uh, that will consist of uh, analy uh, best analytical experts politicians informa uh, information specialists that could help and to, to uh, prevent these uh, this uh, this distorted informational acts uh, f effects that come from Russia and uh, ensure our information security uh, it's very important uh, second of all we need to stop this inflow of people uh, uh, that come from neighboring Russia territories and that uh, create uh, instability uh, in uh, in eastern and uh, south of southern Ukraine. Uh, we need to do it because, uh, and we also need to st to prevent financing of these groups uh, that are financed by uh, by Russia that uh, and create uh, uh, the stabilization in the in eastern and southern Ukraine. Uh, well, third of all, we need to uh, to finally proceed with the signing the association agreement and securing. Uh, financial aid package from the IMF and from the EU. Actually, <coughs> EU, uh, I think it was a couple of days ago, they uh, um, they made a statement that they're ready to that uh, that they were ready to give us 15 billion dollars in the next couple of years, and uh, probably it will help us to stabilize our financial, sit economic, and financial situation. Uh, um, at the same time, I think we should also what we should do is. Uh, also to proceed with uh, activating our activities uh, with regard to uh, uh, to NATO. Uh, I think that we should uh, not not like right away, but uh, step by step, and we should send a clear message to to Russia uh, that uh, like because of uh, non-compliance uh, with uh, all the documents that we signed with them, bilateral agreement in 1997, Budapest memorandum that was violated many times by them and which is uh, constantly ignored. Uh, we have to send a clear message that we will proceed with uh, with this uh, Euro-Atlantic integration and will because it will can only be the only possible way to ensure our territorial integrity and sovereignty. So. Uh, I, you know, you're aware that uh, I think yesterday or two days ago, uh, um, a, new, a draft law was uh, was registered in the parliament uh, on making amendments to to the to the two laws on the basics of national security of Ukraine and basics on, on domestic and uh, foreign policy of Ukraine that will uh, will uh, neutralize this uh, that will take out this uh, neutral status that we declared in these laws and will uh, return the provisions on uh, uh, getting back on the uh, Euro Atlantic track and. Uh, and uh, and setting this purpose of becoming a NATO member in the future. By the way, uh, the Secretary General of NATO a couple of days ago he stated that uh, that uh, the NATO is ready to proceed with the talking about uh, sector, uh, talking about uh, improving uh, cooperation and like uh, and uh, as uh, was declared in uh, in the NATO Bucharest summit in 2008, they're still ready. Uh, and we see one day Ukraine as a NATO member. So no, right now we could uh, proceed with uh, working on this membership action plan and signing it, uh, because all we know, all of us, all, uh, all of us 
know that uh, in 2006 uh, Yanukovych he went to to Brussels and refused to sign it. 2013 he refused to sign the association agreement. So he uh, <laughs> is the person that really destroyed uh, this uh, dream of uh, Ukrainian people of uh, becoming part of the of the Western world and pursuing this. I think it's important for Ukrainians to make this civilization choice and and uh, do something. Uh, about the future, and I don't see the future of Ukraine as a neutral state or the state that is uh, integrated in this Eurasian future, Eurasian Union. So I, I see no future in that. Uh, mm, so and also we, uh, um, in the short to middle term perspective, we should work on securing our energy security. We should uh, uh, we should activate this uh, this implementation of this uh, reverse flow arrangements that were. Uh, that were agreed by the uh, by, by the Ukrainian uh, by the Ukrainian side and uh, Slovakian side. I th uh, Slovakian uh, government they expressed their readiness to proceed with this, uh, with uh, allowing 10 billion of cubic meters of gas to be transferred uh, to Ukraine and 5 billion. We agreed about 5 billion of cubic meters of gas with the German company RWE. So well, it's like 15 billion dollars. So in order to achieve that, we have also to to take necessary steps to modernize our gas transport system and uh, ensure uh, ensure this reverse flow of gas back to Ukraine because Russia uses all all, all available means to uh, to new, uh, to put uh, economic and energy pressure on Ukraine. And uh, everyone knows that we are completely dependent uh, 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 on Russian energy imports. So we have to do something about it, increase energy efficiency, involve, uh, engage with our European and American colleagues on, uh, on conducting energy efficient and energy saving uh, measures, implementing these technologies in Ukraine, and also working on securing uh, the reverse flow of gas, and also working on... Uh, on uh, uh, developing renewable energy sources more. We uh, we have had some good, uh, uh, you know, we have made some substantial progress, and we should uh, uh, work more in this direction. So, but uh, and uh, I'll say a couple of words about Crimea. I think uh, uh, that uh, that we should set. I think uh, the previous speaker said that we should send uh, some. Uh, um, some uh, international organizations, experts there to monitor the situation, and also journalists, <coughs> so they could keep an eye, eye on uh, on everything what is happening there, so that the, so that the world could see what happened, that Russia violated territorial integrity of Ukraine, and uh, uh, despite of all the agreements that were in place, despite of uh, UN charter, and despite of other things, so. Uh, and uh, the the, fa the facts and arguments that they use they are completely controversial. They do not reflect the real state of things. And uh, the whole international community is uh, on the side of Ukraine and not on the side of Russian Federation. So, in my opinion, uh, 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 we should uh, we should uh, we should do not resort to use of force. We should be careful and not provoke because I think that Russian side just waits for this uh, kind of provocation so that they could. Uh, uh, begin this large-scale uh, military operation and occupation of Crimea, and uh, there is no uh, like there is no uh, no evidence that they actually uh, scaling back the troops and uh, uh, within this uh, Black Sea Fleet uh, territory, uh, as was stated by Putin, it hasn't been done, and still many strategic objects still uh, have been blocked and uh, taken uh, by. Uh, by Russian side, and they are not self-defense units. <laughs> it's obvious. And uh, now uh, all we have to do now just uh, um, um, just to 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 send this clear message that we will not let it happen. Ukraine, Crimea will stay uh, Ukrainian territory. And this uh, referendum uh, that they uh, declared uh, the uh, Supreme Council of Crimea it's uh, completely inappropriate and in violation of the constitution of Ukraine that says that, uh, well, the territorial, uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian territorial integrity is viable and uh, nobody can change the territory of Ukraine and uh, only, uh, only an overall Ukrainian referendum can uh, let, uh, can, can be conducted on changes of the territories of Ukraine. So Crimea as an auton autonomous republic has no right to do that. It's in a direct violation of the constitution of Ukraine and of other laws of Ukraine. So uh, it has to be made clear to all the 
people that are interested in taking Ukraine away, uh, taking Crimea away, that this not this, this is not going to happen. And I hope that our Western colleagues will help us in uh, preventing Russia from withdrawing the troops uh, from Crimea. Thanks. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Irina. Over to you. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, Frankly speaking, uh, the project that began three months ago took me by surprise. I'm, I have been here for two months, and when all this started, I was still in Kyiv working in a think tank. And uh, I was, I remember walking back from an NGO conference, and our office in downtown Kyiv, it shares its building with a news agency. And people there all know all the news in the, the first place. And where we were coming back, they told me and my colleagues that our government refused to sign this association agreement with the European Union. And it was the same day when all this protest started. And what took me by surprise was not why, why people started protesting now, but actually why, didn't do they, why they didn't do it before. Because any way you look in economics, in human rights, in, uh, the political system, you find many reasons to, for people to protest, to express their discontent. Like, for example, violations of human rights when uh, there, were, there were political prisoners and just courts, crimes that were made by police and well-connected people and went unpunished. Secondly, we, ha we had this corruption and misconduct of the top officials when the, the way, w there were shady schemes of public procurement, there were uh, voting in the parliament was rigged, and the very elections of the parliament, parliamentary members were falsified. And also, if you look at the Index of Economic Freedom that is published by Heritage Foundation, you can see that Ukraine is on the 155th position from the top, and it puts it in the repressed economies. So, um, and also we are the last, part of the last country in Europe on the 43rd position according to the Index of Economic Freedom. So the economy is repressed because of all this corruption, poor property rights, and bad investment climate. But these uh, problems haven't been voiced actively in public discourse. So you, you, could, you could see some local protests, NGOs talking about it on round tables, but it hadn't been uh, raised up to the national issue, so everybody kind of knew about it, but n n nothing happened that could just start up this discussion, start up this protest of people who are discontent with the current state of situation and who could somehow oppose it, protest against it. And when uh, this, the, the, uh, this governmental decision happened that sparked all this protest, we also saw some really um, the social problems that have been present in Ukrainian society, but uh, were just become clear when the people went out to the protest. For example, it is a it was a low level of social connection of social capital. I'm a sociologist by education, and I wrote my thesis paper about social capital. And it is argued that the more people are connected, the more they cooperate with each other, the more power they have to change the situation, to have some political influence, to cooperate and to influence their lives. But in Ukraine, uh, it, according to recent uh, general national polls, only 5% of people took part in any NGO or <coughs> political party. This is a quite low percentage because it showed that not much people are integrated, are engaged in all this public life. And when you, when the sociologists from my university made a poll at the beginning of December of the people who were in downtown Kyiv uh, protesting on this Maidan and Zlashnitsky Square, it, the poll showed that 92% of them, so almost all of them, came there by themselves. So they were not joined by a political party or the representatives of some movement or NGOs, so they are, were just individuals who came there, there and who just decided to join the protest, to join the, this, this movement. And so what it means for, for the process, that they had little organizational and cooperational skills, because when you are an NGO member, when you have connection with the people, you know how to do it better, you know how to organize events, how to coordinate people. And for most of them, it was the, maybe the first case when they were a part of community doing something. They were t together 
moving towards some goal. And also it means la lack of vision, because when you communicate with people, when you have a common case, common organization, it means that you have some goal, some, uh, something that you think that should happen later. They, they have their demands, like resignation of the pa president, the, uh, parliamentary election, freedom from repression, and justice for those who were guilty in these crimes. But what lacked was uh, the vision on the future. What, what do we want instead? Like, uh, what, what, do we do, what, what do we do when the guilty are punished, when the government resigns? And still, it could be even seen now that we have a new government, but still all this uh, his agenda is still under discussion, and it's only now happening, this process, that our new constitution, our new laws are just drafted, and everything is just beginning to, to be discussed. And the second moment that uh, was clear, that became clear at the protest, that we lacked political leadership, because there, there, there have been three political parties that were in opposition to the former president, but I couldn't say that they were the leaders of the protest. So they were kind of separate from the people. They <coughs> were present at this protest, by the, but they were not considered to be the one who led the people. So the lack of leadership meant that, uh, that there was maybe a lack of cooperation between the civil society and political leaders. And then now when I look back at the protest, I think that maybe if there was more cooperation, more trust, more experience of of politicians and people working together, then maybe those protests could be fast, could, could succeed faster, could be quicker, could, could somehow may, maybe avoid these losses of lives or these tragic events. So for, for this, uh, this, this protest began a spontaneous uprising of people who were not normally politically active, uh, but who were not guided by any political force. So on the other hand, it gave them this independence opportunity. Uh, as, as it was said that they didn't come, people didn't come there for to support some politi political figure. They came there for their for their own goals, their own agenda. And yes, what should be mentioned that if we uh, the protest lacked uh, effective communication. It was somehow influenced by the censorship on TV channels when you could find only maybe one or two channels that. Uh, Air this uh, the, the events from the from the protests, but other channels that were controlled by the oligarchs who were close to the former president and the, his entourage, they aired sitcoms and TV shows when there were people killed on the streets of in Kiev. So uh, the people uh, in, uh, in the national scale they didn't have access to this information, and the, there is also one thing that you can see only when you go abroad that. I only saw it when I came here that there is lack of information in English, <laughs> like the, the one that you can uh, show, you can communicate internationally. Okay, I know Ukrainian, so I follow Ukrainian news, I follow social media, but when it comes to English speakers and the international community, they have been getting this information. Um, I I could say like a, via the second hand method, so from other people, from bloggers, from some po political. Journalists like this, so they didn't they did not have the access to this to the source of information to this uh, objective just news as soon as that they emerge. Now the situation has become better maybe due to to the work of journalists here and in, in other countries. And on the other hand, on, because of the work of volunteers who translated the news as soon as they arrive. But at the beginning, it led to this <coughs> somehow distorted image of Ukrainian protests. At best, they were seen like um, people gathering together to enter the European Union. But at worst, they have been seen like some uh, narrow group of right-wing people just fighting for power. While by the time, the, the, by this time, there were the people have been actually uh, struggling for political change, and the protests have been going on in Kyiv and in other cities of Ukraine, and all kinds of people were participating from students to the middle class, to the workers, and to the re retired people and war veterans. And, but what also surprised me positively about the protest that 
people prove to be very efficient in their cooperation and organization. You have heard about all these groups of volunteers and med medical groups and self-defense groups. It started as uh, accommodation and food for the protesters. Uh, people started bringing warm clothes and medical supplies. And eventually, it evolved to this whole system of informational hotlines, makeshift hospitals when you couldn't go to the normal hospital because you were under the risk that you might be kidnapped by a police person. Um, Self-defense groups, because there was no police defending people, and if there was, it was actually attacking people instead of defending them. There were headquarters of the Maidan, of the politi political parties, and there was also the public council of the Maidan. Also, they had street patrols, IT people, uh, open university, and church and prayer tents right there on the square. So uh, you could say that it was a kind of country within a country. So all these institutions that are normally run by the government, like defense, medical assistance, uh, political leadership, information and others, uh, they have their own. All these institutions where they like parallel structures. And for people, it seems like for me that it was a good experience to see how the country works, how actually the, the state works. Because once, when usually you pay your taxes and then you have no idea what are they used for, where they go, you, they just, they collected money, they had their fundraising initiatives, but then they published reports and people could actually see where, where the money goes. So it was a good experience just to be sure that the defense groups actually defend, the doctors actually help, and the money that you pay are actually spent on something that you need, something that is needed for people. And um, what now? Uh, going to this, I would like to finish with the, now with Crimea situation, the Russian occupation of the part of the territory of Ukraine. I, I could also think, talk m much about how it could be maybe prevented or what we could do better, but uh, what, I, what I learned during this protest is that um, the more rights and the, the, the better situation is at the beginning of the protest, the more easily it is to solve the problem. For example, uh, one of my colleagues in my NGO in Kyiv, he was arrested and beaten, beaten by the police and then arrested, and he was under the threat of 8 to 15 years of prison for participating in the protest. And then they put him into prison and they waited for the court. But then again, what helped him much was that by this time we had our uh, public uh, non-profit groups of lawyers who helped people in such situations. And they contacted these lawyers and they managed to to uh, change his uh, arrest for house arrest. So it was an, a little bit improvement in his situation. So for me, it was, a, uh, now, now he's completely free, but for me, this was the case when the, the more you have, the more opportunities you have by the start, the better it is to solve the situation and to help the people. But as our protests uh, show that it is never late to start, even if you are not a part of the NGO, if you are not a, uh, connect with some community, you can always come and begin, begin, begin by volunteering, begin to, by joining people in their actions, and so eventually it helps to build, build up this community that effectively co cooperates and coordinates and keeps the revolution going. So now f for me it seems like maybe there, are, there have been problems in Crimea, social, political, maybe also economical, but it's never late to start doing something about it to, uh, well, we, now we have a new government, we, we, we want to build our new country, and we don't want to fight, we want to keep our country peaceful and together. And so I hope that, that this positive protest experience of working together, of in, engaging international community, and engaging all the people in Ukraine will help us solve the situation. Thank you. Thanks very much for our speaker. <laughs> I think that was a, a, a fascinating and much broader picture than the one we usually receive here, where we're so focused on the movements of, of Russian troops that we're maybe missing some of the really important developments that are going on within Ukrainian society itself. Um, we are going to open it up to uh, questions from your audience. 
We have a couple of roving microphones, so I have a question right in the middle here. Identify yourself, please, by name and affiliation, so we can Hello. capture it all. Okay, so, uh, my, name is I'm, uh, my name is Bartosz Szydliński. I'm a visiting researcher at Georgetown, but in Poland I collaborate with uh, one of the biggest friends of Ukraine, namely with Alexander Kwasiński. So also a very loyal ally of the United States during War on Terror. Uh, for the reason that we are in think tank, because in Poland we fully support your fight. You know, that we know this is not only about the future uh, Ukrainian state, but it's about the values. But for the reason that we are in the think tank, I would like to add something about this weakness of the, your revolution. Namely about the two political powers in Maidan, they don't have a lot in common with such values as freedom. Namely about the Svoboda party, and the Pravi sector, right, the right sector. They basically, especially the right sector, is not only anti-Russian power, this is anti-freedom, anti-human rights power, because they're also anti-European, anti-Polish. So I would like to ask your comment about such powers as Pravi sector and Svoboda party. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thanks for your question. I'm I'm concerned that it's not a, uh, uh, it, it's not the worst. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, about right sector, uh, uh, Russian media to, uh, like to use it. I know. Well, let's say uh, um, every country, every city, every city, and even in Poland, have its radicals everywhere, even in Poland even in Europe, in Greece, in Germany, everywhere. So probably sector, it's most of them, like, I, I don't know, are there a politician party? But, uh, political party, sorry. But uh, um, it's not so worst as we can see on Russian news. Uh, some, some, uh, some of, like, even like here in DC, I've heard a lot of, uh, not a few, like, that they are like some kinds of anti-Semitism or something. But during the whole Euromaidan, and even like still now, there was no even one occasion for somebody who was beaten because he is like, because of his nationality, or because he of uh, color of skin, or because his political views. Private sector, yeah, of course, maybe they're a little bit crazy, yeah, it's true. But most of them, they're like 18 years old. So they're like romantics, that's why. On the other hand, a lot of these romantics, they love their country and they were killed and injured during the clashes. So if you will go there to right sector and you can say, I'm Jewish or I'm American, or you can get directly to their tent or just to talk to, to their leaders, I'm sure they won't beat you or do something harmful. That's true. That's my, it's my own experience. So I don't advocate them. I don't like this balaclava and I don't these radicals and some like slogans. Maybe it's not so good for European audience. But like basically, like, yeah, it, it happens everywhere, but they're, they're, we can say like, maybe peaceful, yeah. So like in this meaning, so it's, it's not so worse. And maybe you want to add you something. You want to add point. anything? Uh, well, I could just say that uh, the right-wing groups, they, have, they are not mainstream political parties in Ukraine, and they still, on, on the latest election, the Svoboda party to take 10% of the seats in the parliament. And I don't see there are many perspectives for them in the future Ukrainian uh, pol politics, because it's my, my, when you have revolution, when you have this dangerous situation is good to be near a guy in with a beat and with something to, to protect you and who, who who are going to like football hooligans or something like this who are going to to, to to be good at clashes with the right police but when the peaceful times finally hopefully come I don't think that it, it they will evolve to a some kind of mainstream political party I think so. and as far I wanted to add because I remember this Warsaw, it was a Euro 2012, and the clashes, so your fans also don't like Russians' fans, yeah. <laughs> I remember this bridge. <laughs> so, I mean, of course.
Yeah, well, we've certainly seen those reports here too, and it's interesting to um, to get your further information on the uh, motivations and influence of these groups. Um, we have a question over here uh, on the left. I am. Uh, thank you for coming to DC, and we appreciate your time here. I am Mr. Lloyd from the Philippine Daily Inquirer. Uh, my question is about uh, your former leader, or shall we say, Viktor Yanukovych. Is there no action or initiative from the Ukrainian people to file a case against him regarding all of these corruptions that he have done to the country and also the mass murder of the protesters? Thank you. Yeah, sure. I can see. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah. If you go to the website of Ministry of Internal Affairs of Ukraine and you type his name, you will see that he is on the most wanted list now. So, <laughs> and his picture is there. So he is, uh, and the uh, Ukrainian side also filed uh, this uh, case, this informational case to the international police, Interpol. And uh, I think that if he is in Russia, they'll have to. Uh, extradited him back uh, to Ukraine because we, due to our intergovernmental agreements uh, on extradition of such people, and I uh, hope that he will be sent back and will, will uh, be punished for all crimes that he did with all other his people uh, that are in, in his entourage. And uh, yes, yeah, so so he's on the run, but he's the most uh, like he's the he's wanted person. So, charges uh, are there. I'm wondering, uh, uh, only he or? Uh, also, uh, no, the they are in the process. Officially. Mm -hmm. uh, Officially, it was former uh, Minister the of Interior Affairs, the Karchenko, uh, who else? And, and uh, Pshonka? Yes, the, the former yeah. prosecutor? For the general, general, general prosecutor. prosecutor yeah. Yeah. They are working on it, uh, but it's uh, the work is has been very slow. They have to like accelerate the efforts because mm -hmm. these uh, these guys will just leave the country, and actually, Anukov is left, and I think others also left. And uh, well, the, the Russians don't seem to be much in a, a cooperative mood, unfortunately. Well. Uh, we have a question back here from Voice of America. I'm Catherine Gibson, Voice of America. Nikolai, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the experience as a blogger and the thing that was mentioned in your introduction about getting your blog shut down by a crony of your president. If you could just talk a little bit okay. more about your experience in, in that. Uh, okay, I will be brief. Uh, probably you know this, if you monitor Ukrainian media, you know this website, it calls Charismandent.net. Uh, the owner of uh, this media holding uh, the former owner, he his uh, uh, sell, uh, sell, uh, sell, sell, sold his uh, sold his this uh, media holding, which included correspondent, few radio station, and few newspapers. He sold it the, to to another uh, businessman close to president's family. And on this website, correspondent, there was famous one of the famous blog platform. Let's say so you can you can see it uh, you you could see it on the main page. <coughs> Uh, after this new owner took office, they, they try they even established some kind of like uh, censorship department. So now nobody they, they just shut down. I mean they just shut down block platform despite a lot of famous people just right there. They just put it in some way. Like, I mean it's it's impossible to find even for me. Maybe it still exists, but it nobody will read it. And nobody the it probably correspondent they had the the both. Uh, website correspondent.net and the famous uh, magazine it's like maybe it's from middle class you know it's weekly yeah yeah like, or a weekly uh, yeah so uh, and now nobody just read it that's that's the story and what was your role there sorry what was your role there I was a blogger one of the bloggers on the platform yeah yeah so you can find it or if I want after the, after what I can send oh, you thanks. links how about the website you're currently editing? Have you experienced interference with that? Uh, I mean, uh, mm, sometimes I write like kind of freelance, mm -hmm. and um, the problem in Ukraine that there are, I, I don't know, because everything is changing like, all the time, but 
not so many online media which are still objective. We can just mention only Ukrainska Pravda, Radio Svoboda, LBUA, mm -hmm. like not, not many. Maybe my colleagues wanted to add something. But yeah, not much. So, what else? So it's like after. Probably I will try in Washington Post. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question down here in the front. Thank you. Uh, my name is Vitaly Spock. I'm from Ukraine, but currently doing my master's here at the University of Maryland. My question is quite a provocative one, but I believe you are the right audience to ask it. Ask it. Um, let's imagine for a while that referendum that is going to happen in Crimea very soon it is, it is legitimate and uh, observers, international community recognize that it is free and fair and people vote for joining the Russian Federation. Would you accept this referendum and uh, do you think that this might be a solution for current crisis to some extent? First to prevent turning Crimea like to, to another Abkhazia or Transnistria, and secondly, given the fact that uh, the Crimea is, is the only place, is the only region in Ukraine that, where the majority actually are Russian nationals, not Russian citizens, but Russian nationals. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, the referendum, like I've said before in my, uh, in my speech, that uh, referendum on uh, on territorial issues it can only be conducted at the all Ukrainian level, at the Ukrainian level, okay? It cannot be conducted like that, it, and it will be considered Let's illegal. Imagine. No, you cannot imagine something that is against the constitution of Ukraine. The uh, article, I think it's two, let me check. Article 72, I think, and uh, uh, I'll even tell you in a moment. Uh, okay, Article 2 of the Constitution of Ukraine says the territory, ter territory of Ukraine within its borders, it's like, uh, it's united and it's, it's, you cannot, like, it cannot be violated, okay? And according to the Article 73, uh, uh, the, the Constitution of Ukraine uh, uh, decides uh, the issues on the, ter on the issues, uh, the issues of territory of territory of Ukraine, of its changes, so other things, uh, uh, changes, can only be decided uh, during uh, Ukrainian national referendum. So it's, pri it's legally like, uh, impossible to do that. And if it's done, it will be considered uh, Ill illegitimate. So yeah, Russia just uses it just, uh, as a precondition uh, to still uh, keep... Uh, how about Russian constitution? Uh, well, you, Crimea as a, is the territory of Ukraine. You cannot decide issues of territorial integrity of territorial issues based on uh, the decisions of the Supreme Council of Crimea. It's 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 foolish. I talked with <laughs> my <laughs> friend from Sifferopol yesterday and she said that I was asking her about this referendum thing and she said it's already decided. Like it either way people vote other either way that they definitely even those who are against joining Russia or being kind of a separate country or autonomous uh, structure, uh, they are very disappointed and um, they do not even hope that this referendum will show that maybe even if if people would be pro-Ukrainian or uh, wouldn't be able to join, wouldn't would be willing to join uh, to to stay in Ukraine, and uh, this referendum is seen by the general population like the thing is that is already decided, and maybe you have seen the funny way they they. The, they word the questions in the bulletin where there are only two options. Mm -hmm. Do you want to join Russia or do you want to become a, a separate country? And there is no option to stay like it is, like <laughs> to stay in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So the bulletin is very manipulative and you cannot, as a sociologist, I would never ever let somebody <laughs> word the question in this way. <laughs> They adopted the resolution and uh, an accession to Russia. At the same time, they want to conduct referendum. Yeah. You see, there is even a contra controversy in doing this, in, in this fact. But despite this, referendum will happen anyway. Uh, well, like, it and will it will happen in nine days, guys. In nine days. So I think that the best solution, despite the violation, they, are, they, they will just organize it. But I mean, the, the best solution now, I think, is to make it as transparent as possible. To send a lot of journalists there activists, uh, members of uh, international missions, yeah, maybe observers. I mean, because we couldn't cancel it. 
Anyway, it, it's it's illegal. But yeah, the question, your your last question, what if, yeah? What if it happened? And it will happen. We, we understand. Was, would you accept? Nobody accepts. Of course, decision, of course. People's decision to join the Russian. Well, what of people's course. decision? It has to be so done at the international level. It yeah, cannot yeah, be I done. Understand. Yeah. Just, uh, my question is, if people vote, are we follow against the law? Let's just. Uh, accept their decision. You cannot accept yes. the decision that is like uh, even before is uh, considered as uh, illegitimate. So of Pro course I will not accept probably that. Probably the most correct will be just <laughs> ask ourselves what we do after it, after 16, after March 16. We have to do what? Uh, Having like 30,000 of troops in Crimea. That's that's the question. We have now, to act now me. and don't wait for this 16th of March. Okay, okay well we have uh, reached our hour. Uh, should we take one last question down here, and then we'll wrap up? Hello, uh, my name is Bat Kuteli. I'm from Georgia. Uh, uh, I'm with McCain Institute. Uh, so, uh, I have a question on the what is the public perception uh, once now rather uh, started to uh, discuss the changing non-alignment policy and joining NATO renewing the Ukraine's attempt to join NATO and what is the, uh, let's say, public mood in this regard. But before I hand also, I would like to comment briefly on the previous question. Uh, of course, uh, none uh, uh, of the referendum could be considered legitimate once it's conducted under the GAMP content. That's purely the, the most uh, uh, strongest argument uh, while denouncing the outcome of this uh, referendum. Maybe I'll okay. comment because NATO membership. Uh, actually, uh, I'm, I'm sorry because I don't have the recent data. Be because we have we usually have this survey that monitor people's attitudes to the European Union, to, to the NATO, and to other. And it is, uh, according, speaking about the European Union versus Eurasian Union with the Ru Russian Eastern countries, if, if the recent polls show that about two thirds of people supported European integration, and one third of people overall Ukraine supported Russian integration. And but uh, speaking about the NATO, I, I personally think that the attitudes will change now more in favor of the of the NATO because yeah because people see that uh, we need this cooperation, we need to be to to protect ourselves, we need to be more integrated in international community, international defense systems. And yes, yeah, so uh, while I don't know the exact num numbers for now, I can just assume that it will gain more support uh, seeing that uh, all this Russia occupation is going on. Uh, yeah, I will also comment on that. I think we have to be careful with this because the, the NATO issue can be manipulated in the Russian press and other, um, and, uh, and in different media and newspapers. And uh, I think that it will, uh, yes, as she, as Irina said, that we have to think about it now and many people will change their mood, but prior to uh, proceeding with uh, this membership action plan and all this activization of uh, discussions with, the NATO, uh, with, with NATO, we have to prepare Ukrainian people to present them with unbiased and clear information what NATO is mm -hmm. uh, and conduct these campaigns in in all regions, but we have to do it after we stabilize the situation now in Crimea, and when we, uh, uh, and when we, when we have, a, uh, we don't have a threat of uh, uh, Russian occupation forces in Ukraine, because now it can be used against us. But uh, uh, when they will be out, then we can, <laughs> we can speak about it. And but uh, yeah, like I've said before, uh, this uh, draft law on making amendments to two to laws of Ukraine on basics on national security and on uh, basics on uh, and domestic and foreign policy of Ukraine. Uh, these amendments will uh, will, will change will uh, amend the provisions that we're talking about neutral status and will change and substitute them by the provisions on uh, pursuing NATO membership in the future. So it doesn't say that it will happen right away, but we have to think about it. And I think we should send a clear message uh, uh, to Russia that uh, we will, and to the world that uh, we will proceed with it. Because like all the all the inter intergovernmental agreements, uh, uh, international uh, agreements, 
they didn't really help us uh, to, to preserve our territorial integrity. This Budapest memorandum, it was useless even though we gave up our nuclear weapon, which we had the third largest nuclear uh, energy, uh, nuclear potential in the world, we gave it up and, uh, and we, it was uh, based on the condition of getting assurances of, uh, of not non-violating of territorial integrity of Ukraine from uh, UK, US, Russia, and then France and China joined this uh, Budapest memorandum later. So, but you see now, now uh, no, Russia is obliged to conduct discussions with us, consultations on this in case if, if uh, the threat of territorial integrity happens, but they are a violator of, of, of this memorandum of UN Charter and of our uh, intergovernmental agreement of, um, that was between Russia and Ukraine that was signed in 1997. So we have to do it because you, know, you see these uh, documents do not protect us. And I think we also should raise the issue of maybe renewing our uh, nuclear activities, I don't know. Because many, many experts speak about that now in Ukraine. So maybe we should just raise the issue of this because we gave up our nuclear arms weapons and uh, we didn't get anything in response. And we cannot uh, stay neutral, we have to I think we should be integrated into NATO uh, in the medium term perspective, not right away. We cannot do that now. It will only harm our interests. So we should do, we should slowly uh, do it. And uh, by by signing this membership action plan, we then can proceed <coughs> uh, with the, with with this uh, other EU pro European integration issues. But uh, right away, uh, right now, we should also sign the association agreement as soon as possible. I think. And then also uh, move on to proceed with the membership action plan in the near future. And uh, by the way, uh, NATO halted uh, consultations, uh, civil and military consultations yes, with Russia, a couple of days ago, uh, until the the April summit. But uh, but NATO sent a clear message that they uh, they that they are interested in conducting now, uh, improving cooperation now with Ukraine, even though it's now, it's even now, it's okay. We have Na Ukraine NATO annual programs and we closely cooperate. Ukraine has partaken in all NATO activities and has been an active member in all these operations, like Active Shield, uh, thank, thank you, uh, Ocean I, I, Shield and others. Thank, thank you, Maxim. I think we'll let um, Nikolai Go. also weigh in on this as uh, our last uh, work of word of the day. Uh, I'm familiar with your country and of course I have Georgian roots. And yeah, and, uh, just like short remark, because we have now we have a lot of parallels like Crimea and Abkhazia and Russians, they use almost the same schemes like they did in Abkhazia. Mm -hmm. And just to make clear what could happen with Crimea in social media, like now in Ukraine, we share a lot of what, like uh, uh, modern pictures of, yes. pictures of Abkhazia. I mean, Abkhazia, it's a part of Georgia, actually, and um, uh, it was one of the most popular, probably, most attended resort uh, during the so it, it, it's situated on the uh, bank of uh, uh, Black Sea, on the coast from Black Sea, and uh, it was occupied by Russian. And now this territory, despite they were like the most attended, it was the most attended resort during the Soviet times. Uh, it was really depressed region now. I mean, so it, it it could be good example for people in Crimea how Russian care about territory, what, do, what do they occupied. So, so I think. Okay. Thank you very much, Oliver. Thank you to our panel.